might want to wait until after the screen before you do that. Um, just a couple of things. First of all, thank you very much for your patience. Um, that was unavoidable, having a division, but I got to the front of the queue, and so I've managed to come back in, in record time. And uh, also, thank you very much for um, what I hope will be your tolerance and having changed the title of this debate, uh, or, or lecture rather, um, but what happened was that while I was thinking about it, several things happened, and even though I kind of had started sort of um, having quite a narrow idea about um, MPs' views of what um, the electorate thinks, um, it didn't really go anywhere. And then one thing happened, which was I saw a couple of weeks ago a tweet by an MP which said, I have just had a constituent call to complain that their glue stick has dried up. <laughs> and because this lecture was sort of looming, it made me think, how did we arrive at a point where a man's glue stick has dried up and he thinks the best person to ask for help is his local MP? <laughs> because when I first became an MP, I thought the job would be about making and changing laws and dealing with the casework as a way of finding out what it was that the people I represented needed, what worked for them, and what didn't work. What I didn't expect was for that job to be a translation service, a negotiation on behalf of my constituents to help them find their way through what was an opaque and hostile bureaucracy, where you are constantly left thinking, but I thought you were supposed to help me. These government agencies, this whole massive bureaucracy, it cannot be negotiated by ordinary people, even those who are very well equipped to do so. In fact, unless you have access to an MP's hotline or a House of Commons letterhead, it's unlikely that you'll have any success at all. For many constituents who come to see me, it's because they have tried everything and they are absolutely at the end of their tethers. I'm not going to tell you about the man who had a prize-winning and successful microbrewery, who nearly lost everything because HMRC were threatening to seize his assets for a £4,000 fine that he didn't owe, the local council pursuing him for £7,000 to demolish an office that he hadn't built, and a gas company for a gas bill that he couldn't possibly owe because he, because he had everything on electricity. The minefield he had to get through, all on a 10p a minute premium rate phone line, would have been impossible without the intervention of his MP. Far more distressing, though, are the social services cases that I deal with. A constituent of mine left her violent, abusive, drug-dealing partner when her youngest child was a baby. She came from what they call a chaotic family. So when she moved out and contacted social services for help, they sectioned her and they took her children away. I helped the woman put in a complaint against social services about the sectioning and miraculously they admitted that they had been wrong and even more miraculously they apologised. But they hadn't returned the children and were taking her to court on the grounds that she was an inadequate parent and should have her children removed. The case against her was based on the fact that she had been sectioned. Even though they had, they had admitted it was wrong, that was one of the factors being taken into account by the secret family court. And these courts are so secret that as a defendant, if you show the reports to anyone, even if you know them to be factually incorrect, you will be held in contempt of court. The woman's story became very messy. These stories are always messy when you have people who are at breaking point and being pursued by the very agencies that are supposed to be there to help them. It took a very long time, but eventually I got a meeting with the head of customer care and governance who arrived half an hour late. This is, by the way, um, a person who works for children's social services, in case you were wondering. I asked why no one was keeping me informed, why no one would return my calls, and whether the court hearing had taken place. Oh yes, said the woman, and an interim supervision order has been granted. I asked her several times what the court proceedings were for. She said, 
They are for the benefit of the customer. And we always have to have the best interest of the children in the forefront of our minds. But why were they taking her to court? We're not taking her to court as such. It's to enable the service, that's what they call it, the service, to gain the benefit of independent adjudication and analysis. I said I was struggling to understand anything she was saying. All I could think of was that the mother I was representing, she wouldn't have understood a word. She wouldn't even have got as far as having a meeting with these people. And she would have been totally crushed. Are you trying to take her children away and are you using the fact that she was sectioned as a reason for doing so? Oh, that's nothing to do with us, said the woman. We only deal with the children. I said that they were passing me from one agency to another. But they both had in common the fact that their phones ring and ring and even when you do get through to a voicemail, no one ever gets back. That, I said, concerned me. Yes, I can explain that, she said. You see, we have calls coming in horizontally. And she did this, so just to help me understand what horizontally meant. They go to a call centre. All I know, I said, is what I know from the nursery and from what neighbours and family have told me. The nursery says the children are balanced, stable, happy, well-loved, cared for, clean and fed. The only thing that bothered them was the disruptive effect of a man, I assume a social worker from your office, yes, she said, a male social worker from the district had been. So this man arrived at the nursery, unannounced, with a court order to interview the children alone. They said the children were very upset after that. Yes, said the head of customer care and governance, an investigation is underway. It happened a year ago, I said. I explained that she was preventing me from adequately representing my constituents' interest. I'm trying to help her appeal against what could be a wrongful use of the Mental Health Act as a consequence of which she is scared that she might lose her children forever. We can only apologise for that. It's clearly a glitch in communications and I assure you this has been a learning curve for us. Now, I'm not judging whether my constituent is a good mother or not. The children might be better off in care. I don't know. I doubt it, but I have no idea. What I find so alarming is the power these people hold over others, often very vulnerable and distressed people. I am saying that this power is not checked enough, that they are not being carefully enough watched, and no one is holding them to account when they make mistakes. They seem to be free to do what they want, no matter what damage they might cause. But the most worrying thing is the lack of accountability and this lack of scrutiny. It is this that is replicated in the plethora of government agencies and quangos. I'm sure it used to be much simpler. There were politicians, some of them were ministers, and they were held to account by those who were not. Ministers took decisions for which they were responsible and accountable and their civil servants advised them and carried out those decisions. There was a public sector to deliver things like the health service. There was local government for schools, bins and swimming pools. There were armed forces and the labour exchange. We <coughs> knew what they did and who they were and we knew what the lines of responsibility were we could see far more clearly what the taxpayers' money was being spent on and we knew who to blame when things went wrong. And when they did, people would be sacked or they would resign. Today, there are 23 non-ministerial departments, 11 public corporations, 340 agencies and public bodies, there may be more, and certainly if you take the devolved administrations into account, there will be. Each of these has heads, directors, non-executive directors, CEOs or director generals. Some of these are sort of hybrid permanent secretaries of government departments, but even that role has been so professionalised and politicised that it is beyond any recognition. These are the organisations like, I'm going to list just a few of them now, Ofsted, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, the Food Standards Agency, the Civil Aviation Authority, the Office of the Rail Regulator, the Water Services Regulation Authority, NHS England, NHS Blood and Transplant, the NHS Litigation Authority, 
National Institute for Clinical Excellence. The NHS, as you can see, is particularly rich in quangos. The Office of Gas and Electricity Markets, the Green Investment Bank, Ordnance Survey, the Horse Race Betting Levy Board, the Arts Council, <coughs> Sport England, and the Olympic Delivery Authority. The people who head up these organisations mostly earn upwards of £160,000 a year. Some, like the head of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, earn around £350,000. Many of them only work a couple of days a week. The new chairman of HS2 Limited, David Higgins, is being paid £750,000 a year to help drive down the escalating costs of, high speed, of the high-speed rail project. All of these agencies and quangos have buildings, boards, staff, <coughs> even their communications director usually earns around £150,000 or more. And I'm not saying that the work that they do isn't important. I'm sure a lot of it is. They may or may not be worth the money they are paid. What I'm saying is that the work they do and the vast amount of public money they spend doing it is not accounted for well enough and is certainly not well enough scrutinised. And I'm also saying that we have lost sight of who is responsible when something goes wrong. People are moved to another quango, are retired early or paid off. When was the last time a head of one of these organisations was sacked? And how would you go about actually doing it? Who can sack them? Remember the huge mess everyone got into with Sharon Shoesmith? When a constituent comes to see me to complain about his treatment at the hands of Atos during a medical assessment, and if I think there is a pattern of behaviour that concerns me, if I think there is a systemic problem, where do I go? I go to the welfare minister at DWP. She goes to Job Centre Plus. And Job Centre Plus go to Atos because they are contracted to deliver medical assessments. Eventually, I will get a letter from ATA saying no. They're confident that there is no systemic failure. If you then launch a persistent campaign of parliamentary questions and FOIs, if you write newspaper articles, do interviews, get adjournment debates, you may, if you're lucky, achieve something. You might get an apology, and maybe your constituent gets a goodwill payment. But it doesn't address the bigger problem. <coughs> This unaccountable jungle was created by politicians in all good faith. We wanted more professionalism in order to give our constituents the best and most professional public services that taxes could buy. We didn't realise that what we created would take on a life of its own. <coughs> government after government has had every intention of scaling down the number of these organisations but every quango bonfire fails to light. Because that isn't necessarily the problem either. The problem is their opaqueness. It's their casual disregard for the taxpayer, for government and for parliament. <coughs> the Public Accounts Committee interviewed the heads of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority recently. When, how, when asked how much something might rise, one of the chiefs said, it will possibly go up by a handful of billions. That's how casual they are with taxpayer money. At the moment, it's only parliamentary select committees that have any opportunity to question these people. But even then, pinning them down and understanding what they say isn't easy. A man called Dominic Dunn was appointed to one of the many NHS quangos for £63,000 a year to work three days a week. He was asked by a select committee member, we don't have enough radiotherapy in my part of the country. Is it your job to address that lack? Dominic Dunn replied, I certainly agree with avoiding the situation where there is enforcement action necessary. When the Treasury Select Committee asked the head of the Financial Conduct Authority about approving the appointment of the Reverend Paul Flowers to chair the co-op bank, he said, I don't think it was a mistake given the information I had at the time. Committee members pressed and pressed him about the Crystal Methodists' previous convictions, but, no point, but at no point would the FCA chief take responsibility or blame. There was nothing the committee could do other than shake their heads and despair. 
It was Andrew Tyree, the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, who once said that the role of select committees should be refocused so that they concentrate their scrutiny not only on government ministers, but as much on the panoply of quangos, commissions, trusts and corporations that are currently beyond any democratic control. And when we look at the high-profile select committees, we see there is hope. Andrew Tyree and his work on the Banking Commission, the heroic Margaret Hodge on public accounts, Keith Vaz, who did so much to expose wrongdoing and corruption in the police, Bernard Jenkins' work on civil service, on the civil service, and John Whittingdale's dogged pursuit of phone hacking. It is the parliamentary select committees that hold the answer. But to do the job properly, we need to increase their power and their resource. We should look at giving them investigative powers, making accountants and QCs available to them to monitor and scrutinise these agencies and quangos. They should be able to root out malpractice, monitor performance, track and question expenditure. And if someone isn't performing, they should be sacked. So when my microbrewer comes to see me, I know that I need to go to the Treasury Select Committee and find out why HMRC are allowed to pursue him for money that he doesn't owe and to get it stopped. And when my woman complains about her treatment by social services, I will go to the local government and justice select committees to find out what is going on in the secret family courts. And the systemic failure in the medical assessments by ATOS, those will be properly looked at by the DWP Select Committee. These clearer lines of responsibility would give our constituents a clearer idea of what it is we do and what powers it is that we have. But I'm afraid those powers will never include the power to turn dried out glue back into liquid. Thank you.